Hey, this is Pastor John Miller, and I'm looking forward to getting to the message today. It's an incredibly important message for all of us that are listening today. But before I get into the message, one of the things that's on our mind is return from this season of social distancing. This week we've been working on our plans to responsibly bring our people back into our buildings. And while we're excited and anxious to get back together, we're also considering all the factors that are involved. We know that uh, we imagine the day that we'll be all together again and we're thinking about it all the time, worshiping shoulder to shoulder, where social distancing is eventually replaced with normal human behavior. And it's really exciting to us, but right now we're going to focus on the smaller steps that lead to that reality that we all want. Our health is important to us, and we want to be responsible in how we bring the church family back together. So here's what we're doing as a staff team. Number one, we're praying. We're seeking God's wisdom on when to host services here again in our buildings. Personally, I don't want to miss another week of being together, but we're going to put what we want aside and simply pray. Please pray with us. Please pray for us as we prepare for this return. Number two, we're listening. Our staff team has been in close contact with our leaders and listened to many of you as you share your heart. We know that many of you can't wait to get into the building, and many of you will continue to exercise caution over the coming weeks and months ahead. We feel the tension of both those things, and that we want to be back so badly, but we also want to act responsibly, keeping each other safe. Whenever we do choose to open the doors, our plan is to continue to offer online worship alongside our live worship in our building, and you'll be welcome to worship from home or with us in person. Our strongest feeling is that we want to stay connected to you wherever you choose to be. Number three, we're preparing. We've done some pretty extensive research and we're preparing this to be a place that you can feel as safe as possible. We're keeping up with the latest recommendations and we'll be as responsive as we can. We don't take this thing lightly, so our return will be handled with great care. So at this point, we're constantly reevaluating and preparing and praying and we're asking you to pray along with us. Let's pray for the Lord's wisdom in this. Can't wait for us to worship together again, but until that day comes, stay connected with your groups, continue to worship online, continue to give, keep reaching out with your needs at crosscity.church slash needs, and keep praying for each other as we move forward to the day, hopefully very soon, that we can start meeting together again. So why don't we pause for a moment and simply pray right now. Join me. Father, in Jesus' name. I'm so thankful for the opportunity we have to be online with our people week in and week out. Thank you, Father, for the faithfulness of our people. Thank you so much for the the many, many homes in which Cross City Church is represented, not only in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but even in a broader range of places. And Father, today, I pray that you'll prepare us for the message and for the spiritual truth that's so important for us. We pray also for wisdom about future dates. Lord, so that we'll know when we ought to reconvene, gather again in the buildings, and that you'll help us to be prepared in every single way. Protect our people from disease, from this virus. Give them strength, provide for them, meet their needs. Thank you, Father, for all you're doing for us, and for the wisdom you'll give us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles today, I want you to pick them up and turn to the Gospel of Matthew today, Matthew chapter 18. Today's title is, Forgiveness brings freedom. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Our Wish I Knew series is based on a single question. That's a great question. What truth do you wish you had known all along that would have changed the course of your life? Now, mind you, there are many answers to this question. Something better exists was the first truth that we shared dealing with the resurrection of Jesus, that there's more to life than what we just experienced here. Secondly, we uh, hit the second week, truth, still truth, that absolute truth exists because of Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at relationships are real, and the power of relationship is what we focused on. And now, maybe the most powerful and practical truth we can give you today, forgiveness brings freedom. I have to be honest, in our study this past week, this subject brought some of our strongest comments from our teaching staff. At least two of us told stories of people who were restless and without peace on their deathbeds because they had not forgiven someone in their lives. Several others told stories of people who had suffered physically and could not find medical relief until they dealt with the unforgiveness issue and were immediately set free and healed of debilitating pain and illness. It was amazing. We concluded as a teaching team, everyone must know how Unforgiveness can put people in bondage and misery, and how forgiveness can bring incredible freedom. 
So with that in mind, I want you to take your Bibles in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21, at this amazing story. So here's what, here's where it begins in verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one of them who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. That's a key phrase. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So this fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves had seen this happen, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Man, that's an amazing passage. And since the context is always king, let's look at where this teaching takes place. Jesus is preparing to leave his disciples and head to the cross. So this is the time of final instruction. And in particular, he's addressing how people get along with one another as Christ's followers. The context shows us that very clearly. To understand this well, you must know that the forgiveness of Jesus that he's addressing is not the salvation forgiveness, but rather family forgiveness as followers. But the question is, how do we forgive as Christians? And what happens when we do not do this well? Now today, as we unfold in this passage, we're going to break this down into four key areas that are really easy to track, but very powerful for us. First of all, in this story and in this teaching of Jesus, we have a difficult command. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Like most of us, Peter has an issue with someone or with many someone who have offended him over and over. Maybe it's family related. Maybe someone has defrauded him in his fishing business before he began to follow Christ. Maybe someone's lying to him. It could be like many Jews in that day. He's dealing with callous Roman soldiers who bully and take what they want from anyone, anywhere. He's wondering, when does this end? How long do I have to keep forgiving people? The rabbi's teaching that day would tell Peter that if he forgave someone three times, that's enough. And if they sin against him again, write them off. So Peter may have been overly generous in his own mind. Seven times, would that be enough? Wouldn't that be a merciful response, Master? And the response from Jesus must have shocked him. Jesus says, not seven, but 70 times seven. And for the math minded, we've already calculated this in our minds, 490 times. But for the rest of us, we're thinking, that's just a lot. And Jesus intends to convey this. This is an infinite number of times to be offended. It's a ridiculous number if you begin to take it literally. I mean, 490 lies that someone gives to us or 490 bad words that we call, 490 false accusations, 490 slaps in the face. Did you get the idea? It's infinite. And that's what's hard. And Luke's account on this teaching, the disciples respond to Jesus' difficult command by saying one line. They said simply, increase our faith. In other words, this is really tough for us. Or in other words, how are we supposed to do that with some kind, without some kind of supernatural help? We can't just forgive people endlessly. But that's exactly what Jesus has in mind. As Christ followers and as forgiven people, we're to extend forgiveness in infinite ways to those who offend us. Forgiving and releasing people of their offense are to be a way of life for us. It doesn't mean that we're doormat now. 
doesn't mean that Jesus was telling his disciples to be taken advantage of or to be abused or to be run over as a way of life. It doesn't mean that people are absolved of responsibility or accountability. Anyone who hurts us and then tells us we're just to keep forgiving them in order to keep the relationship intact is simply abusing the words of Jesus. We are, however, to forgive. So let me just begin this question with you. Can you identify with Peter's question? Early on in this message, ask yourself, is there someone who you repeatedly have to forgive? Someone who has hurt you and that pain is still present even years later. So, a difficult command. Secondly, in this text, we have something very powerful. That is an astounding act of mercy. Jesus goes on in the story and says, And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt, which was, by the way, 10,000 talents. After the command to forgive, Jesus tells a story of how this looks in real life and why. This story involves a benevolent king who represents God himself in the story and a slave that owed an incalculable amount. 10,000 talents is, by the way, by one commentator's assessment, to be the amount of a solitary worker trying to pay off a national debt. In other words, it's an incredible, inestimable debt. It's an infinite debt. It just goes on and on and on. Much like the 70 times 7, this debt has no limit to it. This is what we call in biblical literature hyperbole. That is the use of exaggeration to call attention to something in order to make a point. The Lord could have said, and the point is, you have a debt you cannot possibly repay. The slaves just didn't have means to repay. So the Lord of the slave commanded the slave, his wife, his children, and all that he had to be sold to pay the debt. And Jesus tells the story in such a way that allows us to feel this way. I hope you can feel it, because I feel it when I read this story. It's indescribably heavy. It's burdensome. It's hopeless. And the slave is helpless in every single way. The slave does what any one of us would have done if our lives were threatened that way. He fell to his feet, and he begged for mercy. And to the surprise of everyone, this next line comes from Jesus' lips in this story. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Now, I'm going to come back to that line in just a few moments because it's powerful. But this is impossibly good news. This is the astounding mercy and the grace and forgiveness we've come to expect from Jesus. It's unreal, and yet at the same time, it's real. I'd love to just keep the story going here, but I must. I have to stop and observe at this point. This story is about every Christ follower. It is the gospel. We have a debt we can't pay. We have a master who desires to extend mercy. When we realize our hopelessness, we throw ourselves at his feet. And when we do, it triggers the mercy of a holy God who made provision for us through Jesus. So let me pause and ask you this. Have you experienced this? Can you feel the weight that's being lifted like I can, like other believers can? This debt that's being paid as a result of the mercy of God. It's a key point in the story that a benevolent Lord exists and he forgives hopeless slaves and sets them free of their debt. Of course, now we're looking back on the teaching of Christ that took place 2,000 years ago, just before Jesus went to the cross and died in the place of every single hopeless slave on earth. So this is powerful. Peter, listening to this from Jesus, should feel the promise of forgiveness at this point. We, looking back, should unquestionably feel the forgiveness from our own personal debt to the Holy Lord. And I'd go so far as to say, if you don't feel this forgiveness, then neither will you be able to handle the earlier command to forgive others who have offended you. Let me ask a question. Do you remember being painfully aware of your sin that separates you from God? Do you remember the moment where you recall the weight of that sin being lifted and the joy of being forgiven, that's what most of us call our moment of salvation. Years ago, K. Arthur said, if you do not understand or receive the forgiveness of God, you will find it almost impossible to forgive those who have deeply hurt you or who have failed to be to you what they should have been to you as a mate, as a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a child, or a friend. We live in a call-out culture. We live in a cancel culture. And if we have a disagreement of some sort, it's normal to call you out, to cut you off in some way. But never is our culture calling for forgiveness. That's not the cancer culture way, but it is the Christ culture way. The kingdom of heaven is a forgiving culture. 
We make mistakes and we are forgiven, for which I'm very grateful for. We fall and others help us get up. We're not to hold it against others because Christ doesn't hold it against us. Thirdly, in this message and in this text that Jesus is giving us, there's a wicked response. This is the downside of the text. The text goes on and says, But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So here we arrive at a problematic part of the story. By now, all of us are impressed with the Lord's benevolence and assume the slave would have learned something about forgiveness, but he has not. The master storyteller wants us to feel outraged here. The people in the story felt outraged. We're to feel it as well because of the response of the slave to his forgiveness is to act wickedly instead of graciously. Everything about the debtor to the slave is the same. He owes money. He makes the same kind of plea, almost word for word, but the response of the forgiven slave to the one who owes him is wicked. Now, those are not my words. Those are Jesus' words. Jesus calls the slave in this verse, in verse 32, wicked. It is wicked for those who have been forgiven to be unforgiving. Now, there's something wrong here in this slave's life. There's also something difficult here. And Peter and the other disciples are already struggling with it. So if you're struggling with it, you're in good company. Don't write me off yet. Don't tune me out. Don't try to escape the truth that's about to come. I'll come back to this, but first let me put it in a positive way. Believers in Christ who receive grace and forgiveness from him should extend it to others. That needs to be the mindset that we have. That needs to be the way we think. We need to recall the weight of sins we've been forgiven of and remember that weight that Christ lifted when others offend us and hurt us and malign us. I have to do this all the time. When I pause and I say, why should I forgive someone else? Why should I extend mercy? Because mercy has been graciously extended to me. So remembering that act of forgiveness will help us know the goal each of us should have to forgive others. You'll be amazed at how powerfully this works in your life. So let me ask you a question. Does it make sense to you that experiencing forgiveness can enable us to extend it to other people? Please trust me when I say it does give you the power to do it. Now, the fourth part of this message has to do with an unforgettable warning. And this is where we're going to camp and spend a little bit of time here. Because at this point in the text, Jesus moves from a parable, from a story, after Peter asks his question, to an application. Now, the next verse I read is part of the story. And then the final verse I read is the application. So here's the end of the story. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. Now here's the application to Peter and to the disciples and to us. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now this really gets serious. The parable ends And the application for the disciples who asked the question in the first place begins. In the story, the Lord was moved with compassion when the servant asked to be forgiven. But now he's moved to anger when the servant wouldn't forgive others. Once more, this story is not about salvation, which is unconditionally given, but it's about forgiveness in the family. And the hyperbole used here to make the point powerfully carries all the way to verse 33, where torturers are waiting to punish the wicked slave until he repays. Now, listen carefully. I do not believe that Jesus was saying there's a class of torturers out there, like enforcers from a loan shark, that make you hurt if you don't behave. However, if you take this lightly, you'll ignore an obvious warning from Jesus. You may not realize the cost of this, but you will be imprisoned into an existence that confines you from all healthy relationships, if you take this lightly. The world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart Warren Wiersbe said. Jesus highlighted the power of forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer. Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is how Jesus taught his disciples to pray daily. It was Jesus on the cross who looked at those who had crucified him and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is the heart of the gospel, the heart of Jesus and all of his life and teaching and the heart of Christianity. And you and I were called to live in the freedom of forgiveness. You will never experience the freedom Christ promises until you forgive others 
from the heart. In 1999, my wife and I were struggling with an issue of offense, and it was difficult to forgive. We had many conversations about it, much prayer. It took a period of time, and it took God speaking to us in some very unique and powerful ways before we were actually willing and able to let go of the offense and forgive and learn to trust again uh, those that offended us. But the day we forgave, the very day, we saw doors open that had been closed for many, many months. It's almost like a dam was broken and, and the, the flood waters came through in a very, very good way. Provision was made. All kinds of answers to prayer was made. The day, the day we forgave, it was incredible. My wife and I talk about it frequently. Here's the truth. Forgiveness brings freedom. In fact, that's the title of the message today. Jesus is saying forgiveness brings freedom. I'm telling you, as a father of Christ, Forgiveness has brought freedom in my life. Furthermore, this warning tells us that you will trip up time and time again over unintentional offenses and over experiences uh, when, with tormenting misery if you don't release people, if you don't forgive them when they offend you. Your words will be weighted with past offenses. You'll be misunderstood by those who are not aware of them because hurt people hurt people. And if you don't forgive, you'll remain hurt and you'll keep hurting people. Someone once said, not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Would you let that sink in for just a moment? Now again, this doesn't mean that I remain in an abusive situation where I'm consistently maligned or hurt or mistreated. It means I simply cut them loose and I cut myself loose from further pain, further obligation, further torment, so I can walk in the spirit of obedience as Christ calls me to and empowers me to. Corey Ten Boom, in one of her great articles that was written about her life and in her book, describes a, a momentous moment of uh, forgiveness. If you remember her life story, she was a prisoner in a concentration camp during the era and the reign of Nazi Germany. And as a young girl, basically she and her family returned to that concentration camp. I'm gonna read some of her own words as I describe this unforgettable story of how forgiveness set her free. She said, it was in a church in Munich where I was speaking in 1947 that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. One moment I saw the overcoat uh, and the brown hat, and the next a blue uniform and a visored cap with a skull and crossbones. Memories of the concentration camp came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharply protruding beneath the parchment of the skin. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in her home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent, and now he's in front of me, hand thrust out, a fine message following. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. It was the first time since my release that I'd been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. He goes on, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he said. I was a guard there, but since that time he went on, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Again, the, came, the hand came out to meet me. Will you forgive me? And I stood there and could not. Bessie had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many minutes that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition she says that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Still, I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You can supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. 
The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hand, the former guard and me, the former prisoner. I'd never known God's love so intensely as I did then. With Corey's willingness came God's power to forgive her former captor. What, what a story. Today, I want you to realize the power of forgiveness. And today, I want to give you two invitations. Now, the first invitation I want to give you today is the invitation to be forgiven through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. I want you to think back to the story for just a moment. There is a master who has a willing heart who wants to forgive his slave of the 10,000 talent, the inestimable amount that he owes him. And in that story, Jesus is giving us a picture of a benevolent God, a merciful God. And he's giving us an opportunity to realize just how big the debt is that we owe him. The debt of sin, the debt of separation, the debt, debt of rebellion against God. But the invitation to you today is this, that you come and receive the forgiveness that only God can offer through Jesus. And we do that by falling at his feet. We do that by saying, Lord, I can't repay you. I can't do anything about this on my own. I can't earn back all that I owe in my sinfulness. And it's really true. The Bible from cover to cover talks about the need that man has for God to make provision for him. From the Garden of Eden all the way through the end of the Bible, we have this amazing principle that, that someone must pay for our sins. And Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. So the first invitation is that you, by faith, can trust him. And by faith, receive his forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Now I want to pause for just a moment and give you that opportunity before I move to the second invitation. So let me just ask you today, can you remember a moment in your life where the weight of sin and the, the, the debt that you could never repay to God, the bridge that you could never cross, the chasm you could never bridge in any way, do you remember the moment in your life where Jesus Christ took care of all that for you? Now you may be listening here today and you may be saying, you know, I, I really don't recall that. I don't know if there's ever a moment like that in my life. And, and if you're thinking that way, let me tell you, it's a perfect moment for you in your home, wherever you are listening to this message. Perhaps you're alone, perhaps there are a few others with you, but I can tell you today, it's an amazing moment for you to realize the vast love that your Lord, Jesus Christ, has for you. The great price he paid of giving his own life and the opportunity you have is amazing to receive forgiveness and receive eternal life. So this first invitation is about you praying and asking him to forgive you and to give you this gift of eternal life. I'm gonna pray a brief prayer and I'm gonna invite you to follow me just a phrase at a time. If you're ready to receive forgiveness, to have sins removed, to have Jesus be your intercessor and the one that pays for your sin, then you join me in prayer right now. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for Jesus' death on the cross. And Father, today I want to place my trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to give me the gift of eternal life. Today, I turn from my sins and I place all my confidence in you for the future as well as the past. I ask you to be my Savior and I also ask you to be my Lord. I choose to follow you and I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're responding to that first invitation, and you'd like to let us know, there's a place that you can click further information. We want to give you further information for making that decision. And we'll come back to that in just a few moments. Now, I mentioned that there are two invitations I want to give today. Here's the second. The second invitation is to forgive others. Now, as we said a few moments ago, the only way you can really forgive someone else is if you've experienced forgiveness and you understand all that you've been forgiven of. And there may be some of you today that have already experienced that in life. You know you're a follower of Christ. And some of the things that we've said today are challenging to you. You may be like Peter. He's wondering, how many times do I have to forgive someone that hurts me perpetually? There may be someone that you know who comes to mind right now who has hurt you, who has abused you, wounded you, and maybe even now they continue to hurt you. But you must forgive them. 
Who is that person? Who is the one that brings you the greatest pain, the greatest heartbreak? Maybe there's more than one, but at least one. Who is that one? Now the scripture gives us a clear path for forgiveness. And that clear path is found in verse 27 where Jesus used the story to show the process. See, the, the, the Lord felt compassion and he released the slave of the debt and he forgave him. And here's what I want to say to you today. You can make three clear statements that will help you be able to release those who have sinned against you. First of all, you can say to the Lord, I will feel compassion for others as Christ felt for me. That's the first step. Today, with that person in your mind, I want you to feel compassion for them. Now, it may not be an emotional feel, but it's a decision to experience compassion. Compassion really is an act. It's an act of uh, giving mercy, extending mercy. The reality is Jesus didn't feel compassion on the cross, but he was moved with compassion because he had you in mind. And that's what you need to have, the ability to have compassion for others as Christ is for you. So first of all, with that person in your mind, I will feel compassion for them. Secondly, you need to say, I will release them by declaring them free by Christ's power. Basically, by saying that I'm claiming the power to remove their hold on me. They're not going to hold me back. I'm going to cut them loose from that in the same way that Christ released me. And thirdly, I will forgive them from obligation to me. I don't need their apology. I don't need their repentance for me to move on. And in this prayer, as we pray, we're going to release them and we're going to release you by the power of Christ. And here's the question. Who do you need to forgive today? And will you take the steps to walk in freedom by forgiving others? I mentioned the first invitation and we pray. Now, at the end of the second invitation, I'm going to lead you in a very brief prayer based on those three statements. Join me in this prayer as you have that person in your mind right here, right now, and we can walk with you through this. Dear Lord Jesus, today I'm going to extend compassion to the person that's hurt me. In the same way that you've given me mercy, I'm going to show mercy to them. Father, by Jesus' name, I will release them. I declare them free from me and me free from them by Christ's power. And then, Lord, I will forgive them from obligation to me. I just release them. And today I ask you that you deal with them. You work in their lives. But today I'm free of that pain, that hurt, that wound. And I choose to move forward. Lord, lead me as I walk in this new freedom. And thank you for the power of that freedom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you've prayed this prayer, we want to walk with you further. Whether the first invitation to allow Christ to forgive you of sins or the second invitation where you're forgiving others, we want to walk with you. We provide a link at the bottom of our screen for you to have further conversations with us. We're thankful for what God's doing in our lives and in your life as you listen to us week by week. God bless you. We have a lot to think about and discuss today. We've got some questions to help you process this with your family friends, or your connection group. I just want to encourage you to also take a few minutes to pray and ask God to show you anything that you may be holding on to that needs to be forgiven. In just a few moments, we'll show you those questions, and I hope you take time to discuss and pray. Before we get to those questions, let's remember that next Sunday is Mother's Day. We were thinking that one day just isn't enough, so we're starting something called Seven Days for Mom. We're going to challenge you to find something kind to do for your mom every day this week. We made a list of those ideas on crosscity.church slash mom. If you and your mom are in different places right now, maybe you just need to reach out to her every day and just tell her one reason that you love her. Or maybe you're like me, where my mom has gone on and passed away and is with the Lord now. But every day this week, I'm going to write a different reason why I'm grateful for her. So today, click the link, start making your plan, and we'll have fun things for mom every day on Facebook and Instagram. Make sure you check those out and take a few minutes now to discuss the message, and we'll see you again next week.